Welcome everyone to the perspective series for SnowTrack on uh, Snohomish County transportation issues. We have a great panel today, um, six city council members from all across Snohomish County with their unique perspectives on transportation issues. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a lively conversation. We have about uh, 10 to 15 questions to get through. Um, but I'm guessing we're not going to quite get through all of them. So we're going to try to save time for um, our guests here today, uh, for those who are attending, to be able to ask questions at the end for the uh, council members. And I hope the council members have some questions for each other as well uh, as we go. So, so we have Don Vini of Arlington, Amanda Dodd of Bothell, Susan Payne of Edmonds, Paula Ryan of Everett, Kim Daughtry of Lake Stevens, or Rory Payne Donovan of Mount Lake Terrace. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition or SnowTrack, we advocate for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. We do that, uh, especially for uh, priority populations, uh, people with low income, people with disabilities, older adults and youth, as well as uh, several other key priority populations. And a unifying theme across all of them is uh, the inability, uh, the lack of access or just choice uh, of not driving. Um, and so we want to make special attention for about the 25% of the population who do not get around by driving, making sure their needs are fulfilled. With that, uh, we're going to just jump right in to our panel discussion. Um, I'm excited uh, to have our, our council members here today. Um, so to start, let's do a quick round of introductions. Um, We'll start with Don. Uh, please share your name, uh, what city council you serve on and for how long you've served, and then the top three ways you get around. I know you probably don't get around just one uh, way, so if you could share kind of your top three, that'd be great. And then because this is a transportation forum and we know you are decision makers, um, if you serve on a local county or regional transportation policy committee of any sort, it'd be great to, to know what that is. Uh, so with that, we'll start with Don, um, and we'll get this started. Hello, all, and welcome today. Um, I'm Don Banny. I serve on the Arlington City Council. I have been on the Snohomish, or the Snowtrack Regional Board here, or the Council, for probably the last year. I also serve on the Snowtrack Board of Directors as the Vice President. And as far as transporting and how I get around, most of it, of course, by vehicle and by walking. Fantastic. Um, Amanda, would you like to go next? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Amanda Dodd. I've been on the Bothell City Council for about a year. I was appointed to the end of a term. Um, I also am on the Snowtrack Board of Directors as the president, so I get to work with Don and Brock a lot. Um, in addition to that, as the city council, um, the city council has appointed me to serve on the East Side Transportation Partnership. Bothell is in both King and Snohomish County, so that's an East King County partnership where we plan along the 405 corridor, um, basically from I-90 to 527, which is really great. Um, I get around, I do drive. I um, get to have uh, my full-time job, my part-time city council job. I have an eight-year-old, so I drive a lot while I manage a disability that makes it hard for me to walk and stand. I also bike. I'm lucky that I can bike without having that pain come through. And I do try to walk when I can. We have a great regional trail system. We're actually the, where a lot of trails meet in Bothell. So we're very lucky here. Thank you. Susan. Hi, um, I'm Susan Payne, Edmond City Council. I've been on council for four years now. And um, my top three are car, walk, and bus. So it's always adding I'm gonna to try to add bikes as well. And that's that's gonna be the next challenge. But this year has been um, super busy. I've got a lot of things going on. And so I've used my car more, but um, I do love taking the bus. And, I'm, and I currently serve as an alternate on the Community Transit Board of Directors. And I'm also appointed by um, my council to represent Seashore Transportation Forum. And what's also nice is I'm also, um, a representative for our climate protection committee, which is 
absolutely um, focused like a laser to um, reduce vehicle miles traveled and um, reduce greenhouse gases. So it works really well together. Paula. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paula Ryan. I serve on the Everett City Council and uh, my top three ways of getting around. I'm lucky enough to live pretty close to downtown. I have a walk score of 92 for my residents. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, so I can walk to the co-op and the library and local restaurants and whatnot. So in both of my jobs, I work uh, for my day job. I work for the county and then my night side hustle is as a Everett City Council member and both those buildings are right next to each other downtown so I can I do walk quite a bit to work and back. Um, I also like to ride my bike as often as I can. Uh, it's been a great way to get to know the bike lanes in Everett a lot better and then um, I, I also have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old so most of the driving comes with uh, just carting them around to get them to their activities. Thanks. Great thank you so much council member. Um, Kim. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kim Daughtry. I'm city councilman at Lake Stevens. I've been on the council for 14 years. Uh, I get around primarily with my van, my work van because I am a contractor, so I do a lot of driving. Uh, unfortunately, they tried to get on uh, community transit buses with my chop saw, and they just don't have any way for me to do that. So <clears throat> I'm usually in my van. Uh, like I said, I've been on the council for 14 years. I've been on community transit board of directors for 12 years. I'm a part of SKIT, uh, PSRC transportation board. Um, what else am I doing? Um, <laughs> I've been in and out of snow track. I've never really, uh, I just, I get there as soon as, as often as I can. And uh, that's, that's about it for me. Fantastic. Thanks, Kim. Uh, and Rory Payne Donovan. Thanks, Brock, and, and good to be here. Um, I've served on Mount Lake City Council since this February when I was appointed. Um, and, you know, I primarily get around, well, actually, um, uh, the only sort of regional transportation focused uh, board that, that I'm on um, is the Seashore Forum, and I'm our alternate for, for that um, body for Mount Lake Terrace. Um, I, I get around uh, a pretty wide variety of ways. I, I have a car. Um, I also commute and, and run errands on by motorcycle sometimes, but I, I'm an avid bicyclist and um, do that both for recreation and, and for errands. Um, and I, I also uh, enjoy taking transit as um, as I'm able to. I, I have access to an office space in uh, downtown Seattle, so I'm often on the CT commuter buses when I'm going down there for in-person work. So, um, and, and, you know, I live in sort of central Mount Lake Terrace near our incoming light rail station. So I, I enjoy um, walking to, to sort of community events and, um, you know, errands when, when I can, so. Thanks, Rory. Uh, this next question is kind of for anybody who participated. Uh, so from October 2nd to 8th was the National Week Without Driving, uh, an experience to try to, um, for elected officials and other public officials to experience what it'd be like to uh, get around without a car, although you didn't have to uh, completely go car free, but go through the exercise of thinking about it. Who here was able to participate? Um, and um, what did you learn from the experience? Amanda. Thank you. Um, so I participated, I will tell you, um, working full-time, being a part-time city council member, part-time person running a campaign and full-time single parent, it was a lot because um, I I also found out I have two bikes. So Susan, if you want to try one of my bikes, let me know. But um, I the one that hauls my kid around that my eight-year-old can sit on was broken. So I was able to tag in a friend and borrow his cargo bike for the week. Um, so we did we did bike as much as we could. Um, sometimes whether it was a bad physical ability day or just a day where I had to be sort of 30 places all in a row, it just didn't work. So it was um, really great to just be reminded that our systems don't always work together. We prioritize driving. That makes sense. That's the most common way people get around. But um, when you can't do that, 
you don't have systems that link together very well. So it really reminded me that if we're going to put all of our, you know, we can't put all of our chickens and eggs in one basket. I'm trying to think of a phrase. It's not coming to me, but <laughs> we have to, we really have to make sure that we give people who can't drive um, options. So I, it, it was a good reminder that you can get into your little driving um, tunnel vision and you need to step out of it sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Paula. Thanks. Yes. I also, uh, as my second year participating in week without driving and uh, it's just a really great reminder of uh, the privilege that comes with being able to uh, easily participate in a automobile focused transportation system. Uh, I am you know, lucky enough that I can walk to work and whatnot, but there were also considerations of just those easy trips to like, oh, go to the grocery store. And all of a sudden that's not so easy anymore just to hop in the car because you have to take into consideration hauling gallons of milk <laughs> and, um, and just making sure that you can have the right bags with you if you need to walk in the rain. Uh, I did have to, I did walk through the rain a couple of times and I'd posted on my social media that uh, any, as a third generation Washingtonian, I do not have an umbrella. <laughs> so walking through the rain was a, a very wet experience. And um, usually it's not that big of a deal, but just because of the distance, I would usually, I usually would have driven but then to have that not a reminder that it's not always an option for people just to hop in a car and go uh, was a good way just to to center myself and remind myself that, you know, just because it's an option for me doesn't mean it's always an option for everybody. And, um, and then there's uh, some other concerns, too, especially like for physical safety, um, walking home at night when it was really dark out. Uh, it's just a place of vulnerability uh, for me as a, a woman and a woman walking by myself and um times when I would usually use my car if I knew that I'd be having to walk home in the dark. Um, again, like that's not always an option for everybody. So just the inherent vulnerability that comes with not being able, not the inherent vul vulnerability that can come with not always having it be an option to be surrounded by the shell of a, a vehicle is was a good reminder as well. Yeah, uh, Rory. Yeah, thanks. And um, I, I did participate and I, I met, I, to drive, my partner and I are, are moving in together, and and you know there's really no ways around moving large objects without um, yeah uh, without automobiles when you're sort of combining households, but um, or you know not without you know hiring someone otherwise. So it's, it's um, you know I think you know the main takeaways from my experience were sort of about you know, the sort of state of our infrastructure, right? I think, um, I think Amanda um, sort of captured a lot of the things that I've been thinking about for less able-bodied people. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, as you are walking, you know, whether it's from me walking to the bus, which is, you know, a, a route through Mount Lake Terrace, if, if you've ever been here, um, you know, our transit center um, is at least for our, our big regional commuter lines from, you know, down I-5 to downtown Seattle is in the middle of the freeway. And it's through the middle of a active construction site. And um, you also, you know, if you're within walking distance on old, you know, sometimes heaving sidewalks or overgrown sidewalks or sidewalks with um, cans, uh, trash cans, um in in them and so it's it really is not um not an experience that that i think we we all recognize the the, the major difficulties of um sort of getting places without um you know infrastructure to get there and i think um i want to recognize my my colleague aaron murray who um also i know participated in this and and she i think I saw on social media recognized and, and posted a photo of, um, you know, someone in a wheelchair uh, riding their wheelchair in the bike lane uh, because that was the, the only way that they could get where they were going probably. And so I, I think they're, you know, it, just the whole experience really drives home the, the gaps in our infrastructure and the, the insufficiencies in our existing infrastructure. And, and then also, you know, as, especially as, as council members, uh, sort of <clears throat> highlighting these sort of um, these gaps and, and these like um, these real barriers to to getting from A to B 
um, bringing them up with mm -hmm. our city staff and and sort of um, sort of slowly changing the the culture of um, you know staff engagement around um, you know communicating to residents with you know who put their cans in the or you know trash cans in in the sidewalk um, you know or working with property owners to maintain their their um, you know shrubbery blocking bushes it's it's sort of a, in an aggregate of of sort of um, issues that that really make um, our our um, our built infrastructure hostile to doing anything but driving and so um, I, I really am glad to see the if you know whether or not you're fully participating in, in the conversation I think a lot more people are, are seeing um, this week especially now that it's being rolled out on a more national level um, I think it's an exciting tool to sort of drive home some some points to help people put themselves in the shoes of, of those who are lesser abled. Thanks, Rory. Uh, Kim? As I alluded to in the uh, past part of the conversation, I'm not able to take transit very often because of my job. <clears throat> and taking tools and things on the bus is really problematic. However, during that week, I decided to take a little jaunt to Seattle from Lake Stevens to find out how long it would actually take, how hard it was actually there to do so I could, you know, give some feedback to, back to uh, community transit staff. And uh, it did take me uh, five and a half hours to go down to Seattle to get what I needed to get at one of my suppliers and come back. Uh, it's quite a jaunt from Lake Stevens. So, uh, yeah, it's it is tough to take the bus for what I do, although I enjoyed the process to try to find out how hard it would be to do that uh, you know, on a daily basis to commute to Seattle like that. It astounded me on how long it would take. Uh, and I actually got to use Sound Transit for part of, the, part of it, and I got to use King County Metro for part of it, and I used uh, Community Transit for part of it. So I was on three different systems, and it, it went really well. Uh, I can't say that it was bad, but it was five and a half hours. Yeah. Uh, Don? No, yeah, I spent most of the week, I probably walked the majority of the time, and I think I averaged a little over five miles a day all the walking that I was doing. But I did have a meeting down in Bellevue that was at 7 a.m. in the morning, and I looked at the what my possibilities of taking a transit bus down to there to be there in time, and I figured the same thing. It was going to be probably three, four hours just to get down there almost from the time I was looking at that commute at that time in the morning. So, of course, then I decided I was going to have to drive. But the other thing, too, I've, I've noticed all week because I'm really active with the Special Olympics. And so I asked a lot of the athletes in that program that use the community transit as well as the DART buses. And I was finding out the same thing. Some of them athletes would be... I'm going to say maybe a five mile distance from where they had to be picked up and brought to where they were coming. And some of them were telling me that they would have to sometimes be picked up in Marysville, come clear back to Arlington for somebody that was being dropped off and then clear back to Marysville. So they were having like almost a two hour, two and a half hour jaunt just to go like a five mile distance. So that was some perspective I got during that week, just quizzing some of those people in that community. But other than that, like I say, I averaged about five miles a day walking. Yep. Susan. Thank you. Um, I wasn't able to, I've got the, my schedule. I was all over the map. I, um, my daughter who does have a disability and she uses a, the bus regularly has been, uh, it's been very eye-opening for, for me as a parent and just to help her navigate some of these um, systems. But her work and her planning and the, and the bus don't always um, synchronize very well. But otherwise, it's, I think it's a really great exercise and it puts, people, puts us as decision makers into the role of how, how to make better um, options available for all of our communities. Well, let's uh, shift gears a little bit from the personal to the policy. Um, so uh, in Snohomish County and really across the entire country, but uh, especially in Snohomish County, we've seen a substantial increase in pedestrian fatalities. Um, and the prime location 
for where these fatalities happening is on our urban arterials like SR99 and Evergreen Way in particular, although um, in Bothell, in Arlington, there's other major streets where we've seen issues. And there's a, you know, anecdotally recently, there's been other reasons that seem to have popped up, but uh, over the long term, um, the design of the roadways have been a factor. Um, so what do you see your jurisdictions doing to address the traffic violence that's happening on your streets? Uh, Susan. Thank you. We've just started, we started at the start of the pandemic and um, switched over some wash dot dollars to put in um, big planters from and starting from South SR 99 and start moving North. And so there's been a lot of construction. It's, um, it's brought a lot of green into the area. It slows down traffic by, by giving the visual effect of having smaller lanes. And it also provides a refuge for people who do try to cross 99 in the middle of the night wearing all black um, in the rain. It's, it, it does provide a refuge for people to um, pull, pull out and pull up and, and to get to a refuge spot. So that's one of the things that we're doing. Um, the, the roadway size is, is a huge significant um, barrier for the, for the east and the west sides of Edmonds. What I'm really excited about is WashDOT has now adopted a complete streets law and Edmonds is going to be one of the first communities to be able to use it to add um, separated bike lanes, um, a dedicated transit lane and to, to basically add more options into our footprint there. And it's pretty exciting to, to know that that's gonna be coming up soon. That's great. Kim. Oh, you might still be on mute, Kim. I guess I should unmute. Um, there, like Stevens, the only thing we've been doing for pedestrians so far is to put up the flashing lights and, you know, big LEDs for flashing like crazy in your face and stuff, only to find out that it doesn't really do any good. Uh, people are ignoring it anyway. Uh, we had a really near miss uh, right down here at Lundin Park not too long ago, uh, which really got the citizens upset. It, it was a small child that hit the light and a truck just blew through anyway, and almost hit the child. It was witnessed by several. Um, I like some of the ideas that Susan was talking about. I know Marysville does some of the same things to reduce the lane width of the streets and put some, some uh, barriers in there to protect the pedestrians. We are looking at doing that on uh, several of our streets, Main Street downtown, uh, 91st Street uh, in the uh, in our shopping district. Uh, we're looking at, at uh, pedestrian ways and bike lanes that are separated from uh, the passage of vehicles. But on another note, I have noticed, and so have a lot of people noticed that since COVID, um, something has changed in people's minds that allows them to be, I would have to say selfish, in that they don't pay attention to uh, speed limits. And they don't pay attention to what's on, going on around them uh, to where they're being more careful. Uh, we have noticed in Lake Stevens, the speeds have come up um, probably about 12% over the time. Um, we're starting to do some things about that. We're looking into a camera system that can do automatic ticketing in front of uh, school zones, which has been on the law for a long time. A new law passed last year by the legislature is that we can do it in front of parks. So we have several of our parks that we're looking at installing those automatic ticketing. There are some problems with that uh, that we still have to uh, go through. And the other uh, issue we're having is being able to hire enough police officers to have any traffic police. Uh, that takes special uh, training for that, and uh, it's really hard to keep up. And I know all of the cities are having the same problem with hiring police officers. So it's a, it's a big problem, and uh, I really do see it as that we've got to get the word out or try to get our citizens to slow down. I mean, a lot of those uh, traffic deaths with civilians or pedestrians are people are just not paying attention. They're going too fast. Um, so... But putting up barriers and stuff, uh, Susan, we're looking at that. I know Marysville's doing a lot of it. Um, some of them aren't even raised. They're actually, they're actually putting in some of their 
uh, wastewater or, or you know storm runoff into ditches right alongside. And I've seen two or three vehicles go into those things, and the vehicle does not survive that. <laughs> Fortunately, they haven't hurt anybody, but um, the vehicle didn't survive it. So people need to slow down in those areas. I'd like to do the same thing for some of our uh, stormwater runoff here in Lake Stevens. Rory, I think your hand was up next. Thank you, Brock. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to sort of put a fine, or not a fine point, but uh, really acknowledge what Kim's sharing about uh, behavior and, and speeding and, and sort of uh, irresponsible drivers. I think society-wide, there, there's been an acknowledgement of, of something having changed and I think traffic deaths, um, you know, especially pedestrian deaths have, have really borne out, um, you know, whatever, um, you know, the pandemic and um, the last few years have, have done uh, to to how drivers drive. Um, that said, I, I really view this um, this problem as as one of both behavior and and infrastructure. Um, you know, be it barriers or street width. I, I think um, you know, as as certainly Mount Lake Terrace is, sees a lot of development in its core transit oriented mm -hmm. development zone around the light rail station and its historic city center. Um, uh, it's my great hope that, that we, and, and staff, I, I want to acknowledge that we have a few staff on this call, um, you know, have, um, you know, sort of outcomes in mind. Um, and, you know, as we're looking at, at our town center, you know, we've, our, our past sort of plan that, that we've uh, approved um, for, for the town center itself, like um, I think can be improved here with our our comprehensive plan update that is going on. I think looking at um, the number of, of parking spots in the town center, um, looking at how we are building out uh, pedestrianized streets and making sure that that we actually have zones where for uh, people to congregate um, that that don't have cars and and there are you know there's sort of pedestrian safe paths, be they sort of green streets or sort of neighborhood streets to actually get across town by bike or or walking. Um, it, it all needs to be sort of uh, more coherently um, sort of designed and developed. And, and of course this requires, you know, um, actual development of, of properties in, in these areas, but, but they're also, I think, Really, more tactical things that that we as um, city council members should be asking for. I think there there is data about you know be it paint on the ground or lower cost options to improve pedestrian experiences. Um, certainly in, in Mount Lake Terrace, where you know we're a, a you know nearly approaching eighty year old um, sort of post war suburban town that's always been historically fairly dense, but we still have many of our streets that don't have sidewalks that, um, you know, are, are likely to see new development in the coming decade. And um, I think what, how we do sort of engineering and design standards and actually do um, at the staff level, um, sort of pedestrian throughput modeling instead of just vehicle, uh, vehicle time sort of modeling in terms of how we build our, our transportation plans and how we um, get all of that. Um, on the books and and executed will will make a big difference in how drivers behave and um, so I'm you know there, there there's a lot there um, but it's my my hope that um, you know we we take a look at these things um, really seriously and, and take an incremental approach because um, there there have been a few really near misses in, in recent years in terms of pedestrian fatalities in, in our community that have have seriously injured people. Um, and, um, you know, we, we haven't had a great response, frankly. Um, I, I think there, there's a community expectation that we do more. And I think folks really recognize the, the importance of, of, of infrastructure. And I, you know, at least from, from my neighbors and, and residents of Mount Lake Terrace are hearing pedestrian safety as a, as a higher and higher priority. Thanks, Roy. Uh, Amanda, and then we'll go to Don. Uh, for the fun. Thank you. I, I do want to echo a lot of the same concerns that everybody has already talked about happen in Bothell. Um, 
And just especially that post pandemic sort of, I think selfishness is a good word. People don't want to be caught in traffic. The problem is every other car on the road. It's never your car. Um, and so I think that that's a really important perspective for all of us to keep within ourselves and share as we navigate in our communities. Um, I also want to call out some of the great work that our staff has done in Bothell. So our, our shared council vision, which is a, it has to be unanimous to make the vision, um, includes um, lowering pedestrian, uh, pedestrian and traffic deaths. And um, one of the pieces of work that predates that but has gone into it is our bike plan, which in my mind really evolved from bike lanes to shared use paths for a lot of the corridors in our city so that we have separate pedestrian and cyclist infrastructure. I've noticed when I ride a bike by myself, I get more confrontational driver behavior. And when I ride a bike with my eight-year-old on the back of the bike, people are delighted by it. And so I always like to um, bring that up with people to, to make, like, I'm not less human when my kid isn't behind me on the bike. I'm still his mom. I still need to get home safely to him. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to see the difference. Um, but even just on top of that, I, I am blessed to take care of my father who's physically disabled in a wheelchair, who does have to use the bike lane sometimes with it when there's either missing curb cuts or a lack of a sidewalk. And because it's a power wheelchair, I mean, he could topple over. So he has to be very cautious where he um, rolls. And then my brother doesn't drive. He has um, intellectual disabilities and he walks, you know, I think it's like a quarter of a mile, but again, there's missing sidewalk. And even one of the sidewalks that he does go on is covered in thorns. And one of the biggest things I think we can all do, you don't have to be in office to do this, but definitely if you're in office, do it, is just call things out. Like I fill out the little form on the city of Bothell website and I'm like, Hey, there's thorns all over the sidewalk. What does it take to get them trimmed by the property owner? Or like, can I do it? Um, and it didn't come to that. They, they reached out and they trimmed it, but just keeping an eye on our communities and traveling places where you don't live or you don't go right. Like I have my normal haunts. I have my coffee place that I like my church, my kid's school, go all over your city and try to find those areas and just kind of get that started. I think a lot of people are so busy trying to get everywhere, you know, everyone else is the traffic. That's the problem. Right. But if you take a minute to just see like what could be changed in your community, I think that we can all kind of naturally build up just some reminders for people to, you know, keep the sidewalks clear. Like Rory was saying about trash cans, just stuff like that. I know Kirkland had a really successful campaign, just reminding people, Hey, your trash cans don't go on the sidewalk. They go in front of the sidewalk. And it seems so obvious, but sometimes people just need that reminder because we've all got so much going on. So thank you. Don. Yeah, no, I also echo all the other comments made about the the driver's selfishness. I mean, I see it on a daily basis when I'm out doing my walks and stuff. And I mean, we've been experimenting with the flashing, the blinking crosswalk signs and so forth. And I'm, yeah, there's times where some people will stop, but the majority of the people, well, they will not stop. They just keep going until you got to sit there and wait until you get that opening. And then it's, you got to dash. Luckily, where we've got a lot of these crosswalk lights or at some of our roundabouts and in the middle sections dividing the roads, we do have the safe islands where you can at least stand there and wait while you hit the light for the next one and to get across. But like I say, the drivers, a lot of the drivers are just in such a hurry to get wherever they're going that they don't pay attention. We've actually even put some of the flashing stop signs up just to try to draw attention to some of the stop signs still again we some stop some don't and but it's just that we just gotta start re-educate drivers i think they just like you say since the start of covid it's just they're they're on their own so i think them are some of the big things we do need to focus is getting that out there to the public hey just slow down take a focus of what you're doing and when you come to these intersections and crosswalks and so forth some like here in, in our town, I mean, we've got a lot of people, The they, they'll see the red line painted at the corners for the fire hydrants and stuff and the setback from the intersection, but they'll still park right on top of the corner. So the pedestrian tries to go across the street, all of a sudden they walk out from behind a car and the, the guy coming through the intersection didn't see him. So I don't know, we need to really start enforcing, I think, some of the parking requirements that are supposed to be there. As far as the streets here in Arlington, we do have a lot of streets outside of, on the limits, outside of the city's main street area. 
And there's some of them that do, don't have the sidewalks. So with our transportation improvements that we do annually for preservation of the asphalt, we do go in and we put the sidewalks in the streets where there is no sidewalks. We always update the ADA crossings to meet the current requirements. So we do, we are pretty proactive at that. And that's the one thing I do appreciate with our city that we do really focus on the public safety. Paula. Thanks, I'll try and try and make it brief, but hard for politicians to be brief on anything. <laughs> um, yeah, the city of Everett has quite a few uh, measures that we're working on. Uh, some are in progress and some um, have already been worked on. Uh, we lowered the speed limit on Evergreen for uh, most of the stretch here in the city of Everett just to uh, just drop the speeds down. But even with the speed reduction, it's only as helpful as enforcement is. Um, so folks are, we still see quite a bit of speeding and uh, unfortunately some pedestrian deaths as well. Uh, the city uh, recently uh, put it, voted in favor of red light cameras at a number of dangerous intersections in the city. So uh, with the hope that um, it'll reduce traffic fatalities and incidences at some of the high, um, high incident intersection. So th that should be coming online, I believe next year. Um, the city's active uh, in a, it's a, uh, I'm not sure what the official name for it is, but it's basically a speed study. So it's a comprehensive review of the city's streets and speeds and um, and just a general roadway, roadway analysis to see which streets are maybe um, need to have adjustments to their speed limits just to be more um, conducive for pedestrians and bikes and uh, maybe the speed limit that was set you know 20 years ago isn't appropriate for that roadway anymore so they're in progress on a speed study. Uh, there's also a number of traffic calming initiatives that the city has been working on with uh, crosswalks and just better lighting and um, uh, the little bulbs in the middle of the street to help give uh, a protective space for pedestrians who are crossing at parks and whatnot. Um, moving forward though, I'm gonna be advocating for a more safe system approach to our transportation system that making sure that it's not just a safer system for vehicles, but also safer for bicyclists and pedestrians and folks that aren't necessarily in a car. Um, and also, especially lesson learned that I had from Week Without Driving, like we were talking about, was just how critical it is to have better lighting on our roadways, not just for cars, but for people and uh, folks that are not necessarily driving, just so that we can all see each other. Um, and also for uh, pedestrian lead time at intersections, so that when a pedestrian light does change, that or when a light changes, the pedestrian has a bit of lead time, because so it's proven to be safer at intersections. Oh, and the city is an active participation participant in the Vision Zero uh, group initiative. So uh, they're working on a, a safety action plan to go along with it. So more to come on that. That's great. I, I believe Edmonds is part of that as well. So I want to give a call out uh, in that connection. But um, we're going to go to our next question. And so we can get through more questions. I'm going to limit each question to two answers. Uh, so you're going to have to self-select who is going to be. Um, but our next set of questions are regarding Sound Transit. Sound Transit is building a regional transit system that will connect Everett to Tacoma with the spine of light rail by 2041, as well as light rail to Redmond, Issaquah, West Yellow, and Ballard. And of course, bus rapid transit from Renton to Linwood through Bellevue and Bothell. Um, Linwood Link opens next September, and Everett Link extension is due to be fully completed by 2041, uh, unless Snohomish County leaders are able to work together to find a more than $600 million budget gap to be filled uh, and fill that. So first question, remember just two of you, um, what opportunities do you see light rail or the bus rapid transit in Bothell bringing to your communities? Uh, Rory, you're first and then Paula. So that's it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, yeah, I think for, for Mount Lake Terrace, uh, you know, ST2 completion, you know, it was one of the first uh, ballot initiatives that I think I ever uh, had a chance to vote on, you know, just after I graduated high school. I was going to really uh, sort of change Mount Lake Terrace, um, you know, and, and really set, um, you know, sort of be the impetus that. I think sets in motion a lot of development that we've been 
um, planning for or hoping for um, over since basically 2007, since it was was passed, we've had a, a version of a transit-oriented development plan uh, for our our land use code that really um, has yielded minimal results. So I, I think um, we're, we're seeing that um, sort of wave of development coming. You know, if you drive on or take the bus on I-5, you've seen some of the big um, uh, multifamily unit buildings uh, built right near the, the freeway, but we have, you know, several hundred to a thousand more units probably coming online in, in the next two or three years. And so um, that, that, that will be a game changer. And the, just the, the, the new neighbors that we have will, will um, hopefully bring a lot more um, commerce and community and, and all the, you know, growing pains and opportunities that, that will come with that. So it's, it really is um, uh, hard to understate the, the, the hope and excitement um, that, that it brings about Lake Terrace. Paula, uh, opportunities. Great. Yeah, I think, uh, well, Everett has a, a few different stops and potentially the uh, yard that's gonna uh, come to Everett. And so there's just really incredible opportunities for a once in a multiple <laughs> lifetime, a uh, chance to uh, have a transit-oriented development that is state-of-the-art, that serves our community equitably, that honors the land and honors the climate. Um, so there's a local group that I'm sure Brock's uh, <laughs> uh, familiar with, uh, the Everett Station District Alliance, that is working on uh, putting together a vision for that final stop in the uh, light rail plan at the in Everett that's close to downtown. And the space now is very industrial. We have our train station and a lot of um, industrial businesses, but there's a vision to turn it into the, a transit-oriented development with affordable housing and childcare and central gathering areas, and it'd be it would be an absolutely transformative opportunity for the city to to realize the growth that we need to see, but then also to uh, put in a a space that um, is a real like linchpin for the identity for the city of Everett. So there's some really great opportunities for growth, and to do it in a very smart and thoughtful and careful way. Thanks, Paula. Love the call out. Thanks, Paula. Okay, let's talk a little bit of the challenges that uh, may arise. Um, so what challenges might light rail or high capacity transit bring to your community that your cities are working to address? And Amanda. I'm very excited about the rapid transit that's coming to Bothell. I'm going to yeah. preface with that. I think it's really important. Also, as a multi-county city, we're served by Metro and community transit for local buses, and it's not often that they cross those county lines. So for someone like me who lives in the, firmly in the Snohomish County part, sometimes getting to downtown Bothell is a five-minute drive or a much, much longer bus ride with a transfer. Um, that said, we don't have a, a lot of great comprehensive local bus service. Um, and so that problem is going to perpetuate as people try to take advantage of the rapid transit to get to work. Some people will be able to walk to those routes and just hop on. Some people can't, or it's just, I mean, we, we have a lot of big hills here. I know that that's pretty common in a lot of our cities, but um, so either, I know I've thought about it and either I'm gonna be picking up that 60 pound e-bike and putting it on a bus rack if the rack can handle the e-bike, or I'm walking downhill and then calling for a ride to get back uphill if I'm tired. Um, I don't always wanna climb up the hill I live on. Um, so having comprehensive local bus service, is gonna be so important. And especially as we look at um, communities on the edge of one transit agency service, really trying to find that happy medium of getting everybody serviced, um, even if they are over this line or over that line becomes really challenging. So that's one thing that we are paying attention to. Um, one of the, phrases that has circulated at our council meetings is a, is a circulator bus or a shuttle. I don't know how possible that is. It's something that our staff is, is going to evaluate as part of our latest council vision, but the vision is called Vision 2040. I think one of the hardest parts of this is how long it takes to, to turn the boat when it's going somewhere. So really trying to um, make these future plans while understanding that I might be retired when it's all ironed out. I, you know, if millennials get to retire. Um, so that's, uh, it's, it's really challenging and it's, you really have to think, you know, long-term. Thank you. I think that's a good transition to maybe just skip over a part question and go to the next question, uh, which is 
a lot of our transit service is provided by our bus systems, community transit, Ever transit, and then some of our nonprofit transportation providers in the county. Um, do you have hopes and dreams for what our county's bus systems could be in the future? And so kind of like, what's your vision uh, for bus systems in the year 2050? And what could be done in the next four years? And uh, I definitely want Kim to provide an answer to this and see thinks a little bit more about this and then maybe somebody else. So Kim. Well, my vision uh, for what's going to be happening in the future is uh, a lot more transit oriented uh, type transportation alternatives for people. And that includes some of the innovative services that are coming about in some of our regions, Snohomish or Community Transit is operating one right now in Linwood. We have uh, three pilot projects for more in three other cities, including mine in Arlington and Turrington. Uh, the one in Linwood is more of an Uber style uh, innovative service and where they'll pick up at the door and drop off at the door and then come back and when you if you want to and take you back, which is a, it's a great service. It's, it's uh, ramping up really fast. A lot of people are using it. Um, just as a side note in Lake Stevens, I'm trying to get a fast ferry across our lake because you know we got a thousand acre lake in the middle of everything. That's just a joke. We're not going to get a fast fast ferry service with CT. Um, but I believe that in the future with light rail, and uh, you're going to be able to just about go anywhere that most of the, especially commuters, which is a big deal, commuters are going to be able to get down to Seattle where they're commuting or hopefully we're going to be able to do something that goes north into Arlington because of all of the manufacturing up there. We're looking, we're going to be putting in a bus rapid transit system up the I-5 corridor to get up in there, which is great. Um, Council Member Schwetty and myself, I think Council Member Schwetty's online with us also, are trying to work with CT to get a commuter bus uh, line up Highway 9 from the areas on the east side of I-5. Instead of having you cross over, take that bus and go over. We have a straight shot right up Highway 9. Uh, so those are those are some of the things that we're looking at to get done. I think the future is going to look pretty good uh, for transportation in Washington. We've got a lot of plans out there that helps our roadways, helps for uh, transit systems, our walkways, our bus or bike trails. Um, and then uh, we also have a lot of uh, going on with our ferries, and I think that's actually going to be a bigger deal in the future. Um, ferries are, I don't know if there's any of the ferry people are here. Uh, we just had a little bit of a meeting yesterday with PSRC Transportation Policy Board where we're talking about ferries a little bit. Uh, and what that talk was about is, hey, don't forget ferries when you're trying, you know, legislature when you're trying to fund things, and we want to make fer ferries a priority. Uh, because they need to be. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, I think that there's a lot of us in the different cities and towns that are looking at ways to make our cities and towns more pedestrian friendly, more bike friendly, and safer for those two types of people, or two types of transportation. I know Lake Stevens is one of them. Uh, we are in a process right now at Marysville of making a trail that goes all the way through Lake Stevens up through Marysville and then on, on into the uh, um, the trail system that's already in place. Uh, so we're connecting the two cities with a trail, uh, basically on the east side of Highway 9. And uh, so there's a lot of work being done. And I think that that's what we really need to be focusing on is getting that work done, making them safe, and seeing if we can reduce private owned vehicle use and getting back onto, you know, getting more into the public transit type, type of transportation. Uh, Susan. Thank you, Brock. I, I would also echo a lot of what um, Kim's been saying. Um, I'm hoping that we can bring in a few other things into Edmonds, something similar to the, the zip shuttle that's been, um, piloted in Linwood and is now going to be a regular fixture as part of community transit to solve the, the first mile, last mile problems that we have. We've also got a couple of other things that are going coming in near to Edmonds. Um, we have the new orange um, line that's coming into Edmonds. And with some amount of luck, we'll get it to go all the way down to, to the ferry terminal. And there's also a, a fairly large bus hub down there in, um, in Edmonds. And it also connects up with the, the sounder. 
So there are some things that we do need to do. And I cannot say, you know, often enough that we need to make sure that when we do plan our bus routes, that we go into the areas where we do have some density because housing and transit all go together and that we can we can start building out more sidewalks into communities you know into our i'm thinking our neighborhood commercial zones i mean i don't know if you've been to edmonds lately but it it's practically impossible to get a bad meal here so we have restaurants throughout all of edmonds and getting people just to say this would be great hop the bus go here you know get your get your food from bar dojo or wherever and and then he head off and have your own merry time it these are options that i can see coming into the future and coming in pretty quickly so it does build the the connectivity that we do need to have for all of our communities and uh i just i'm just so excited about some of the the possibilities of doing that so i'm hoping that at some point i'm not sure how we're going to swing it but at some point, um, find some funds to to help support um, our neighbors here. Edmonds has a pretty serious um, population full of um, seniors who would probably like to give up the car. And um, if they and they are all pretty familiar with how to use apps on their phones because they all have smartphones and just ring up a car just to go up to say Bartels or wherever the library to the Center for the Arts that would also provide a nice service for them with the zip shuttle. So I am very encouraged by that whole project. I'm looking forward to seeing it be successful ac across our communities. And I'm particularly excited about that going into Darrington because they, um, they are very remote out there and they would absolutely benefit by that support. Right. Well, I'm gonna ask one final prepared question here. And then we're gonna open it up to the audience to see if they have questions. Um, so I know all of your cities are kind of knee deep, chin deep in uh, conference and plan updates. You got a major update that you got to wrap up by the end of next year. And part of that is the transportation element. And there's been a lot of new thinking about uh, policies. Some of which Rory started to go deep into the, the weeds of some of that already. Uh, like multimodal level of service and complete streets policies and things like that. Um, so what are you most interested in as you start to make policy updates to the your transportation element? Um, anybody can raise your hand to go after this question. Yeah, Don. Oh, you're on mute, by the way. Yeah, I'm most is most interested in the complete street programs as well as the the parking reform. I mean, if we can figure out a design for parking to where people are not parking right, like I said earlier, on the corners where they're blocking crosswalks or they're so close to the crosswalks that cars don't see them as they start coming out into the streets. So I, I really want to see some of the parking reform as well as like the complete streets. All right, and Kim. Well, I believe, I think that uh, Don got it got it right. We're really focusing on complete streets and sidewalks. Uh, sidewalks is a big issue here in Lake Stevens. Uh, we spent, you know, in our budget, we usually have about, we've always set aside $400,000 uh, for sidewalk projects, and we use that every year. Unfortunately, as you all know, if you're looking at sidewalks costing somewhere around $550 a foot, and uh Pretty soon we're going to have that down to the inch, I think, because of all of the things it takes to put sidewalks in when those sidewalks weren't required back when parts of the cities were all a part of the county. It was never required. So we all have, I think we all have streets that do not have sidewalks, and that was part of the plan way back before 1990 in the GMA. So we're fighting with that, and so much that we finally, I know a lot of you already have this, but we have a TBD now. And when we, our council, when we went for the TPD, made it very, very clear to staff that they couldn't even go out and ask uh, to raise our taxes until they had the plans in place and what we were going to spend that money on. And we told the citizens what it was. And 82% of it, I believe, is sidewalks. And uh, so now we're looking at, because we have TBD money funding coming in, we're looking at, okay, can we 
you know, how can we leverage that amount of money through bonds or whatever to front load the sidewalks and get them done quicker? Uh, it turns out that that's pretty hard to do. Uh, the bond is easy, but the staff time is not. Uh, so to get the staff to plan those things out, it, it, you know, to get it to go, and we couldn't do all the sidewalks now if we wanted to. And so that's that's another focus that we're looking at. Okay, how do we now? To what do we do to circumvent that problem? That could be done by contract to other organizations, you know, contractors, things like that. And that's what we're looking into. But I believe that the sidewalk issue, which is going to make our streets safer, and the complete streets programs, I think that's the that's what we're focusing on and updating our uh, comprehensive plan to to uh, do to. That's great. Thank thank you, Kim and Don. Um, Okay, I would like to see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand and um, I will put a spotlight on you so you can ask your question. And if someone doesn't speak quickly or raise their hand quickly enough, I'll just go on to one more question that I got. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna go to a fun one uh, because we have somebody from Edmonds here. Uh, there's been some great organizing by parents in Edmonds and uh, teachers in the Edmonds about doing bike trains to school, especially around uh, bike to school day in May and at the start of the school year. Do you think events like this will change public perceptions and your local cultures yeah. around how we get around? And I think I'll lead with Susan here, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I sure hope so. I mean, we have a very active bike community and they they encourage the the, the, the youngsters, the students, and they are also um, actively lobbying for some South County, um, North King County um, pollination for uh, putting a, a, a bike ped bridge over 104, um, connecting the inner urban trail. So they're all plotting together in a very friendly way. And, you know, you're just, you're, it's all additive. So you're bringing in the students. We've got some oldsters out there on the, on the electric bikes and that's myself included. It's, um, it really is a huge focus on this, um, this whole effort with the students. It will start changing people's minds that, um, Four years ago, when I got on council, uh, there was a huge outrage from, you know, the community is like, why are you trying to put in bike lanes on my favorite driving road? And now, you know, after some, <laughs> I'm serious. The, <laughs> it's sorry, it's a Friday and I've, I've just, it, it's just been a, a week, right? So now we're starting to talk about more uh, bike lanes and making things a lot more accessible for everyone. And it's, and even the people who are so opposed, they are very, um, they know that they have to talk about bike lanes and um, other transportation alternatives because they, you know, otherwise, they, you know, they're in the minority and they, and they recognize that it is a big need in the community. So it, it is starting to make a difference. And I just love that. I like our very active bike community. Um, we haven't heard from Rory in a while. He has his hand up. So Kim, I'm going to jump to Rory here. Oh, well, thanks, Brock. And sorry to jump over you, Kim. Um, <clears throat> you know, Susan just mentioned sort of local level advocacy on sort of impactful projects. And I think both organizing generally, what, whether it be it to get to school safely or to sort of address issues like, you know, uh, Susan mentioned the, the interurban trail uh, being really disrupted and near impossible to, to get um, across unless you're willing to risk, you know, limb and, and lung uh, getting getting yourself up a, a steep hill across a, a terrible state highway. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the other element to that is is going to the, the state. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, that those of you who know me know that this is kind of my, my day job is state level advocacy uh, for a state agency, but um, really there, there's a, a sort of generational opportunity at the legislature, be it through Climate Commitment Act dollars, 
um, or other conversations about how we fund our highways. You know, um, we have an unfortunate sort of constitutional mandate uh, for, that informs, you know, how state uh, transportation money being spent. And, and I think we all know that uh, that's really car centric uh, paradigm there. But as as the legislature, um, you know, discusses how to better fund complete streets, uh, you know, safe routes to schools, and and all these other projects. Um, I, I think it it really behooves um, sort of community, you know, wh wherever they may be, to ask them to prioritize, um, you know, uh, f funding local projects, and, and also um, as as the you know, as a council member for a, a small but mighty city, there there really are um, staff capacity issues and and city budgetary issues. You know, I, I want to be able to like pay my city staff uh, the wages they deserve. Um, you know, maintain all all of our popular you know social programs in our parks and recs department, and um, you know do do all these other um, things that that I think communities asking for in terms of having a safe built environment. And, you know, uh, I, I don't, I, I fear that we're not able to, and it's not for lack of intent or lack of trying, we're not able to sort of do that work um, justice without, you know, resourcing. Um, so I, I think there, there's, there's a lot there as, as I, as usual in my ramblings, but I think there's, there's an opportunity to um, sort of, have the state as a partner in, in this as well to make it happen on a quicker timeline. Right. Thank you, Rory. And thank you all council members for participating today. I thought it was a really great conversation uh, and good perspectives from across the entire county. Um, we do have two more uh, forums coming up over the next two weeks with our mayors. Um, we're still finalizing all of the participants with each one of them, but uh, next week we have the South County mayors, and then the, uh, at the end of the month we have the North and East County mayors. Um, next week starts at 11.30 a little earlier, uh, so I can squeeze it in before another meeting. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, I do hope to have this posted online so you can see it or you can share it with your, your friends and colleagues. Um, and with that, thank you all. <laughs>